what we do now is we run a lot of our intelligence with Victoria Police based on high-risk community locations. So we pretty much evaluate where the issues are happening and from that we've requested cameras to go in to help us with those sort of problems. As far as what offences it helps us with, I can't really think of an offence it wouldn't help us with. So, for instance, um, assaults is one of our main problems, obviously late night assaults in a city are an issue, but there's a lot of defences for assaults and when you go to court, it's very specific what you do. Um, did he punch with the right hand? Was it a punch? Was it an open hand? Did he fall forward being drunk or did he actually go forward to attack someone? All these sorts of things become very specific at court. The, an incident which might take 30 seconds will be often gone over in very minute detail over an extended period of time and human memory can't capture that sort of detail. So magistrates in particular more and more love the use of CCTV to give that independent look at what happened at the time and make their own assessment, not just rely on the police or witnesses' memory on the night. And keeping in mind a lot of our assaults, obviously late night in the city, people are affected by alcohol so their memory isn't at its best. <laughs> It can also help us identify witnesses. So with the use of CCTV, tr backtracking people to other places where we can identify them, we can identify witnesses, which is very crucial for us as well. An independent witness for a court is very important because obviously the parties involved in an altercation have their own view of it, but someone who has no role in it may be able to give better independent um, evidence. It also can give you the background to an incident. So again, a lot of things will happen. There's a crucial part of it that everyone saw but they won't have noticed what happened leading up to it, and that's very crucial, again, for the proving of offences in court. From a council point of view, where I know the councils are like it as well, is that a lot of complaint files that council will receive in relation to noise or disturbing behaviour, cars doing wheelies, that sort of thing, often the complainant will overemphasise the significance of the problem, and councils normally don't have people out late at night to make that assessment. So a very noisy complainant um, can often get a big response to what is actually a small problem. And CCTV, if it's in the right place, can help you assess is there an actual issue that needs to be dealt with. We do know that offenders will keep away from areas with CCTV. So if we're able to let not only the people going out who want to have a safe area, but the predators that want to commit crime are aware of where the CCTV is, covered, uh, is covered, it may displace them from working that area. And whilst displacement can mean crimes happen elsewhere, if we have avenues of safety throughout the city, we can walk safely from a venue to a taxi rank and get home safely. Well, I think people appreciate knowing that and being able to do it, and we would hope we would see a drop in, in crime in that regard. Licensing applications. When assessing those, councils can object as well as police, and a major part of that is about amenity to the area. It's not a better way I can think of you can show the amenity of the area being affected than by CCTV. So, for instance, in some of the objections that I do, I will get CCTV of an area when the licence premise, premises isn't up and running and you can see people moving, no rubbish, no problems, and then you run it when the, the licence premises is open and you can see what's come about due to that licence premises being there. So it is a good, very good tool for that, which, again, the visual image of that is much more powerful than just giving evidence to it. Limitations of CCTV. One of the great limitations is lack of audio. A lot of disputes that occur involve people speaking to each other and what is said is very important. So people can argue that threats were made and they responded to a threat that were verbal, which isn't always uh, obvious in a uh, video which has no sound involved in it. Monitoring is, is a challenge. How many people do you have monitoring the cameras? How many screens do you have? I've been into the, the city of Melbourne security area. It has a large bank of screens, has two people monitoring it 24-7. That's a very big commitment by the City of Melbourne, which a lot of councils won't be able to meet. There is software available, and I'm not going to advertise the companies involved, but I'm assured that they can now do things to the degree where the software will recognise unusual behaviour. So if a person walks up to a car, tries a door handle, moves to another car, tries a door handle, the system will then highlight that camera to a, to a person monitoring it. So that way, rather than being reliant on the person to either view all these bank of screens or have the pictures from those screens rotate, the software will help you do that and manage it. There's a suite of options to deal with problems. We don't rely on the CCTV to solve it for us. Uh, some of the things we do on safe streets, for instance, we have the Salvo street teams who assist us going out and dealing with young people who are vulnerable with alcohol. So the CCTV camera might direct us there, but we have these teams to go and help work with it. We have chill out zones. We work at different nights on New Year's Eve. We will have um, the Rotary come in and run tents and things. 
we're guided to where we put them by the CCTV, and the CCTV offers them some protection, but those other services are there. So by doing that, we're hopeful that some of those problem people or issues will resolve through negotiation. Other things we're doing, for instance, City of Melbourne, uh, RMIT, State Library and Bicycle Victoria Network, we know there's a lot of thefts going on up around RMIT State Library. The CCTV isn't helping us, so we go in and put those other suite of things in there to work with um, situational crime prevention, additional bike racks, education on decent bike locks, because a lot of people use bike locks that don't work. So a lot of these things you have to follow through with, which works in with our CCTV, which when we tie down the times, we can look at who's stealing what and we can put those bike racks under the cameras and help for investigation as well. So that way it works sort of hand in hand with other, with other strategies. The reality is, ever since I've been here, there seems to be a common theme, and that is um, CCTV alone, whether it's an effective suite of strategies, probably won't answer your problems and it probably won't treat the problem areas. And I think if you take a message away from here, that's the most prominent message you want to take away. We have legislative requirement within Victoria Police in relation to privacy, and we have our own protocols and guidelines in relation to CCTV, which I'll go through now. Um, but in essence, it's not by accident that those cameras are placed in the City of Melbourne the way they are. And it's not by accident that we actually have the protocols and the MOU going the way that we do to treat the issues within the city. And it's probably not expected that all councillors will have that capacity, and I know they won't. But Definitely, you need to have an evidence-based approach to how you're actually going to apply CCTV. And you need to have an active involvement and engagement with your local police area commander, because they can help you with that with, through their crime prevention officers and through their local knowledge, etc. And they should be able to provide the evidence that requires to justify whether you should or shouldn't go for CCTV as a treatment strategy. It, it's really quite critical that you have an understanding that if we are going to be involved with you, that we need to have an MOU developed. And we can help you with that. Uh, there are some good examples of MOUs out there which councils are running at the moment. Also, as I said, it's mandatory if we're going to have access to the CCTV and viewing it. What the MOU does. So clearly under understanding purpose of the system, appropriate use and each organisation's roles and responsibility it's really, really critical that you understand what our expectations are of you and you have an understanding of what we require as a law enforcement agency and vice versa, that we understand what your expectations are and the MAU does that. We also talked to, in another slide in relation to, it was mentioned before, SOPs. Now, they're not a mandatory requirement, but I would find it highly unlikely, and I'm happy to be corrected here, but I'd find it highly unlikely the local area commander won't want to have some SOPs running in relation to the conduct of the CCTV and the interaction between Victoria Police and local council. It's a common theme we're all going through here. Is it fit for purpose? Does the evidence suggest it's going to treat what you, what you require for it to treat? Um, by way of a simplistic example, it's very little use to put CCTV in a location where it's poorly lit and you're not doing any other crime prevention through environmental design treatments on the area to actually avail the community of that feeling of safety because all you're doing is putting CCTV up. So you need to be aware that there may be other requirements and police might very well say, that's fine, but we need to address these issues as well. Information Management Standards and Security Division. Now, they're the people who actually um, have carriage of CCTV policy and guidelines for the Victoria Police. It's mandated legislatively we have under CLEDS we have certain requirements in relation to police data, which the next slide will go on to. We take that extremely importantly and we take that as a must do. So that requirement's upon us when we get uh, data from CCTV. It's coming upon us to be legislatively for compliant. We take that very seriously, as I said, but there's also a requirement upon you in, in relation to privacy matters. MOUs will stipulate what that, how that works out and how we transfer information between each other. Victoria is the only one that has a Commissioner for Law Enforcement and Data Security and basically oversees um, the data security for Victoria Police as an independent regulatory body. For your own protection, can I strongly recommend that you actually, if you're going to go and put up CCTV and you're successful in a grant, that you actually have SOPs running for yourself and for your 
relationship with the police. The MRU is a holistic document in relation to how theoretically it should work. SOPs are the doing. They're the document that actually says how you should and shouldn't behave and what you should and shouldn't do. And it's a clear guideline for all staff. A quick review of what we've gone through. Consult your police service area inspector, your local area commander. We will be able to help you in relation to some evidence-based concept about CCTV. Victoria Police does not have the capacity to monitor CCTV 24-7 at our police stations. And I think everybody is aware of that now. But you also have to have the capacity to do what you want to do with the CCTV. And you have to sure you have inbuilt compliances to make sure that you are consistent with how you treat the data. Communication strategy. We're talking about consultation with the community and other stakeholders, probably something that we've realised there can be advantage to having an effective communication strategy about the reasoning behind the location of CCTV. And an evaluation, which has been mentioned as well, it really is critical. There's no use putting something there if, it, if it, there's no evidence to suggest that it's working. Or you require evidence to suggest a, a better way or a better way to improve the application.